sport is replete with a host of motivational phrases that make people want to do amazing things, like just do it. However, I would like to begin with one phrase that may be a little less t-shirt worthy than phrases like just do it. It's the motor, not the machine. This phrase means the motor, the heart, the lungs, the muscles, your thighs, your arms, are vastly more important in the outcome of an athletic activity or endeavor. As a aspiring young cyclist in the late 80s, early 90s, this was a phrase I spoke to myself, my teammates, and my friends regularly to think about and manage my concerns about where technology and sport was going. Phrases like this should be familiar to many 20-something young athletes where so much about that activity in sport is about maintaining, sustaining, often unwavering and illogical beliefs in one's body and one's ability to overcome the seemingly impossible. For me, this phrase began to show some stress fractures and began to come apart on days like this. You see me in the yellow jersey with the red highlights, and I'm behind my long-standing training partner, Chris Petty. What I remember about this day is Chris Petty was riding a steel frame bicycle. And at the time, steel was considered to be authentic, real, and pure. I was riding one of the first mass-produced, carbon-fiber-tubed, aluminum-lugged bicycles. It wasn't as aesthetically beautiful as Chris's bicycle, but at, at the end of the day, it was about five pounds lighter. And generally, it wouldn't have mattered that much, but it mattered on this specific day, because in this race, we were riding up this. And this is not some foreign locale in Spain, Italy, or some other part of the world. It's actually a little closer. It's in Burlington, Iowa. It's a road called Snake Alley. And these hand-laid bricks, even in the dry, were slippery and dangerous at best. But what's interesting about this road is that as we rode up the circuitous route, it would climb roughly 275 feet. And we would do that roughly 25 times. And including the rest of the distance we rode, we would climb roughly 6,000 vertical feet. And I remember that day thinking, I'm glad I'm not carrying that extra five pounds on that steel bicycle. But in the end, that phrase, it's the motor, not the machine, when went out. Chris finished in front of me, as generally he always did. And I've seen more of his backside than I would like to rem remember. <laughs> he was the most talented cyclist I knew. He was on the national team. He had the gift. And it reconfirmed my belief that the body was truly more important than any techno-scientific device or machine within a sporting context. But still, I had that nagging question. Is the technology impacting the games and events that I participate in? And I think clearly it was. And at this moment in time, we're getting to a place where it's harder and harder to disavow and ignore the potency of technology within the context of sport. So let's go to 2008. You see an image of Michael Phelps. This is in New York City when Speedo is releasing its newest version of its fast suit, the Speedo Laser Racer. In the previous decade, Speedo, along with a host of other swimsuit manufacturers, had been working hard to design the fastest, most hydrodynamically efficient swimsuit for competition. 
Over the previous decade, the increments had been small. But in 2008, Speedo got it right. In fact, they better than got it right. They nailed it. And at the end of the competitive swimming season of 2008, over 100 world records had been broken using this suit or similar suits. In 2009, at the World Championships, 43 world records were broken during the championships. And at that moment, swimming had a problem. It had a black polyurethane swimsuit problem. FINA, the governing body of swimming, banned these types of suits in early 2010. But many would argue that the damage had already been done. And that damage was disaggregating the body from the athletic sporting equation. And the question was, what were you watching when you watched elite level swimming? Were you watching the athletes, or were you watching the best swimsuit that technoscience could provide? And you started hearing terms like technological doping relating to these suits. And part of the question was, when we watch athletics, it's about the human drama. But the same idea, bodies still do amazing, incredible things. In 1968, Bob Beeman, at the Mexico City Olympic Games, creates a new world record, but also a new Olympic record. He jumps 8.9 meters. His Olympic record still stands today. And what's amazing about this athletic feat is that he jumps so far, as you can see, he jumps beyond the limits of the measuring equipment. So what that means is the International Olympic Committee had an understanding where they thought the out limit of where an athlete was able to jump, and Beeman surpassed it. He breaks the record by over 21 inches. What's fascinating about it is that it's a moment where we can embrace the triumph of his body. But fascinating enough, when they finally figure out how to measure the jump, Beeman himself breaks down when he finds out. You see him falling on the track because he jumps farther than he even believed his body could jump, which is amazing. So bodies still can do amazing things or unbelievable things, but we have to also understand that technology has always played a role in the outcome of sporting competitions. Let's go to 1954, the World Cup final, Hungary versus West Germany. The Hungarians were the overwhelming favorite. They had been dominating international football for the previous two years, and the group competition had beaten West Germany 8-3. to three. So, in many people's minds, it was a foregone conclusion that West Germany would lose and Hung Hungary would become the world champions. But it's also interesting to think about other conditions that influence the competition. And some would argue that this individual had a role in it. This person you see, his name is Adolf Dassler. He had been working on designing and building and manufacturing elite athletic shoes for decades. He's the individual who designed and built the running spikes that Jesse Owens won Olympic medals in 1936. But what's also important about him is that, by his, to his friends, he's known as Adi Dassler. And he was in the process of building his company that was a merger of his name, Adi Das, or, as we know in the United States, Adidas. Three stripes, this is the guy. What's interesting about that World Cup final is that it began to rain early on in the game. And at halftime, it's 2-2. All four goals are scored 18 minutes in the game. Dossler had been working on this new shoe with removable cleats based on the conditions. The West German team deploys the shoe for the rainy, messy, destructing, falling-apart pitch. And in the 84th minute, 
legendary helmet Ron scores the go-ahead goal. West Germany wins the World Cup, and as the narrative goes, was able to leave behind the history of the Nazi regime and become a global power. As well, as the narrative says, that now you must wear Adidas shoes or Dadidas shoes to be a great footballer globally. But the question still persists. Was it the shoes or was it the athlete? More recently, Nike has created a new program called Breaking Two. And the goal is to break the two-hour marathon barrier. They've chosen these three individuals, three of the best distant runners on the planet, to break the current record, which is two hours, two minutes, and 57 seconds. But of course, being Nike, they're just not outfitting these guys in some really nice kit. They're going to design a shoe. This is Nike's shoe for the, this endeavor, the Nike Zoom Vaporfly Elite. What's special about this shoe is that the foam they designed for it is supposed to return 13% more rebound. They've also designed a spoon-shaped carbon fiber insert to allow people to run with 4% more efficiency. The three athletes you saw before are, will be given a custom-made pair of shoes that's designed to ex explicitly allow them to run as fast as humanly possible. So when we think about these amazing athletic feats, oftentimes we don't think they look like this. When Roger Bannister breaks the four-minute mile record, I assume he wasn't wearing a past pair of handmade Nike shoes. More importantly, it definitely doesn't look like this. This is an image from March 7th of this year. Nike ran a half marathon test. And the test was to see how all the pieces fit together. They chose Monza, Italy, the Formula One course at Monza, and laid out a 2,400 meter track to test. They have a Tesla being driven by a Formula One test driver to make sure he's driving at the specific rate of 4 minutes, 34 seconds per mile, or 15.1 miles an hour. As you can see on the top of the car is a readout, letting everyone know exactly how fast they're going, and they're maintaining the explicit pace. But then you see a flotilla of runners breaking wind for Kipchoge, Decisa, and Tedese, you can see them in the back in the black. So when we think about these great athletic feats, and the motor being more important than the machine, there's a lot of machinery in this event. But of course, they're still running, and we can perceivably ignore all the technology and science being put into this event. However, when we think about athletes like Oscar Pistorius, it's hard to disavow and ignore the place of technology in sport. Pistorius was a heartwarming story of a disabled athlete overcoming huge odds to compete until he began to run too fast. And when he started to run too fast, he was seen as an individual using illegal techno-scientific aids to undermine the authenticity and the tradition of sport. What's fascinating, when he was initially banned from competition, it was not because of a mechanical advantage associated with his carbon fiber legs, but it was an aerobic advantage that he had because he was missing lower limbs. What's interesting about Pistorius is that there was a lot of hand-wringing going around about how to assimilate and integrate athletes using prosthetic limbs into able-bodied competitions. He might have been the leading edge, but athletes 
like you see here, Marcus Rehm, is the present and the future. At the 2015 International Paralympic Committee Championships, Rehm jumped a personal best of 8.4 meters. What's important about this 8.4 meter leap is that in the 2016 Rio Olympics, the gold medal leap by Jeff Henderson was 8.38 meters. You have to go back to 2004 to find a gold-winning medal leap beyond 8.4 meters. So we're here. We're at this moment where technology is influencing the outcome of athletic competitions. But the question I have is, when Marcus Rehm or someone else breaks Bob Beban's 8.9-meter record for the Olympics, will we have the same awe and fascination with him that we have for Bob Beeman? I'm not sure we will, but I would argue that we must, because technology has always been part, part and parcel of sport. Sport is inherently a techno-scientific endeavor. We've spent a lot of time ignoring all the technology embedded in the Nike Zoom Vaporfly elites. We can ignore all the technology on the bottom of Nike shoes, say, for instance, last night when the United States national team beat Honduras. But it's hard to ignore the power and efficacy of prosthetic limbs. And I would like to say we must think very hard about letting go of these narratives of it's the motor over the machine and embrace our current moment and really understand that it must and it needs to be in thinking about the context of sport. It's the motor and the machine. Thank you.